Now what we'd like to do is discuss the concept of current and the conductor that we're going to consider is a wire. So suppose we have a wire and we have a cross-sectional area in the wire A. Now what we'd like to imagine first is suppose we just have charge car some charges that are free to move so we'll make those positive charges for the moment and these positive charges are moving in the wire and imagine that we have a charge counter here at the end which is going to measure the amount of charge Q that's crossing through this area at the end. Then we'd like to define in a time interval so now we want to consider some time interval delta T and as charges are moving through this area we're counting the number of charges and our definition of current I is equal to the amount of charge that crosses through this area divided by delta T. So in SI units we have charge is measured in coulombs, time is measured in seconds, and our definition for current amp, which we give a symbol A, is equal to coulombs per second. Now, a little bit later on in the course, we're going to see that actually the amp is the fundamental definition and coulombs are defined in terms of amps. For example, if we're counting the amount of charges and one amp of current is flowing through the wire, then we say in one second how many charges do we count? That's the definition of a coulomb. We'll see why this is the case in when we study magnetic phenomena. Now again, what we have here is charges are passing through the wire and we have this convention in which we'll draw an arrow to indicate the direction of current. Even though current is a scalar, we have a sense of direction because there's moving and we want to make the following distinction that the direction of I is the direction that positive charge carriers positive charge carriers are moving. Now, what we've looked at before, so you could have an ion beam of positive charges moving and the direction of those positive charges is the current. In conductors, we know that it's electrons that are generally moving, and so what would happen there? Let's just look at the case of negative charge carriers moving this way. And we still say that the current, the direction of the current, I, is to the right. Now this is a historical anomaly because when charges were positive and negative were assigned, electrons just had a negative charge. And so here again we have that the direction of I is opposite the direction, I'll put it in parentheses, that negative charge carriers move. And this is our very straightforward definition of what we mean by a current in a conductor. All right, so now that we've given you some basic definitions about current, we're actually going to build up a model for how charge flows. And the simplest way we can think about charge flowing is just a lot of different charge carriers moving down a wire. Or if we zoom in, we can think of charge flowing through some tube. Now this tube is going to have some cross-sectional area, so this is the cross-section, that we're going to call A. And within this tube, we have a lot of different charge carriers, and in this example I'm going to use positive charge carriers, and they are moving down the tube under the influence of some electric field. So that is what makes them move. Now each charge carrier is going to be moving with some average velocity that we call VD, or the drift velocity. So we already defined that we can think of our current as the amount of total charge, big Q, that flows down our wire in some time, delta T. So to figure out how much total charge is flowing, we first need to say, well, each individual charge 
has some amount of charge little q. And in total, going down our wire, we have some small n, which is the number of our charge carriers per volume of our wire. So from this, we can start to write down what our total charge, delta big Q, is. That's just going to be the total number of charges per volume times the charge of each one of our charge carriers times the volume of our wire. So now we need to work on what our volume is. Well, if I zoom in and I only look at some chunk of wire right here, I know that that chunk of wire has a cross-sectional area A. And if I think of just one charge carrier traversing from one end to the other, I know that that goes through some distance delta x, which is equal to the drift velocity times however long it takes for it to go down that wire. So now we can fill in for our delta q, that's just n times little q, times now our volume we can write as the area times this delta x, which is vd times a delta t. So now we can actually write down what our current going through this wire is. Our current is our delta q divided by our delta t, which if I take our expression for delta q, that's just n times q times the cross-sectional area a times our drift velocity vd. So this is now a simple way of thinking about charges flowing down a wire. But in fact, we can think of current in a much more general way. So if we want to think of, say, current flowing through a galaxy or current flowing in cells, we need a more general definition of what current is. And so we're going to define a new quantity called J, which is a vector. And this is what we call our current density. And this is then defined as our current per cross-sectional area. So if we think of this example, our j then, which is our current per cross-sectional area, we can just divide our i over here by our cross-sectional area a. And so in this particular case, it's just n times q times vd. Now the reason we want to define this j is that it gives us a much more general way to write down uh, the current i for any geometry configuration of charges flowing. So we can just think now of our total current i as being the integral of this j dotted with the cross-sectional area a that it's flowing through. And we take this integral through the surface through which that current flows. So we just built up a model for how charges flow in a wire. And now what we want to look at is how uh, the magnitude of that current or current density actually depends on what you build your wire out of. So if you'll remember, in our model, we have charge that's flowing down some tube. This tube has some area. And inside of that tube, there's an electric field. And that electric field is what's actually causing your charges to move and sets up what we call J, which is our current density or the current per cross-sectional area. Now, the magnitude of that J is going to depend on the electric field in a different way for each material. But in general, you can write the relation, which is what we call microscopic Ohm's law, which is that the electric field is related to the resulting current density J by a simple factor that we call rho sub r. And that factor, rho sub r, is what we call the resistivity of the material. Now, resistivity or resistance, you can already get from the name sort of a physical intuition of what happens. The higher the resistivity of a certain material, the harder it is for charge to start flowing. So if you think of a given electric field, if you have a higher resistivity, you'll get a lower resulting current density J. Now, the inverse of this resistivity is what's called the conductivity, and we use sigma to, to denote that. So this is the conductivity which, as I said, is the inverse of this resistivity. So the definition is just 1 over rho r. This gives us another way to write down microscopic Ohm's law. So we can write j is then equal to the conductivity times e. Now, conductivity is the opposite of resistivity. So the higher the conductivity, the easier it is for charge to flow. So we can come to this relation and see, OK, for a given electric field, the higher the conductivity, 
the easier it is for charge to flow. So these are just two different ways to write down what we call microscopic Ohm's law. Now, if you've learned Ohm's law before, this probably isn't what you saw. What you saw before was a relation between the voltage, the current, or the resistance. So what we want to do next is look at how this microscopic Ohm's law actually gives you back the Ohm's law that you maybe are used to seeing before. Now, if we want to think in terms of voltage, we have to think of this electric field as being set up by some potential difference across the wire. So here we have two different potentials, VB and VA, on the, other, on the opposite sides of our wire. So this gives us a change in potential that's just equal to VB minus VA. And we know how that's related to the electric field now. This is equal to negative the integral from A to B of our E dot dS. So now, what we're going to want for Ohm's law is really just the magnitude of this change in potential. So the magnitude of the change in potential, because this electric field is constant inside of our wire, that's just equal to E times the length of our wire, where our length is really just defined there. So now, if we have this uh, delta V equals E times L, we can use uh, our relation for microscopic Ohm law to come up with a relation between the current density and our potential. So this uh, microscopic Ohm law says that J is equal to sigma times E, which I could also write in terms of the resistivity. So I could also write this as E divided by rho. Our E is now equal to delta V divided by L, and I keep the rho here. And now we want to remember the basic definition of our current density J. That's the current per cross-sectional area, where remember that the cross-sectional area is defined here by the geometry of our wire. So now we're just going to take these last two relations and rearrange things a little bit. So that gives me that my change in potential is equal to I, and now I have a bunch of constants which I'll bring together. That's just equal to rho L divided by the cross-sectional area A. Now this, rho L and A, that really only depends on what you built your wire out of, as well as the geometry of the wire. And we call that combination the resistance R. So this now is what we call macroscopic Ohm law, which is that our change in potential is equal to our current times the resistance R.